Welcome to Misquoting Jesus with Bart Ehrman, the only show where a six-time New York Times best-selling author and world-renowned Bible scholar uncovers the many fascinating, little-known facts about the New Testament, the historical Jesus, and the rise of Christianity. I'm your host, Megan Lewis. Let's begin. Bart, are you ready for Christmas? The I'm ready for question. Christmas. Ha. I'm not. Yeah. No, I'm. I'm definitely not. I, um, you know, I. I've always been a big fan uh, uh, of Christmas. Um, back when I was religious, it had very deep uh, meaning for me. But also, I just always liked the accoutrements. I liked the. I liked the Christmas tree. I was very, very big fan of Christmas trees and and the Christmas carols and everything. And I and I, I still am. Although now, um, for for many years now. Um, we've come over to we've, we've gone over to England uh, for the holidays because my, my wife Sarah's English, and so we go over and celebrate with them, with, and which I which I like a lot, but it does mean no Christmas tree <laughs> for me. Yes. <laughs> and so, uh, and but I still get the carols, and so we're going to we're going to go over, and uh, we'll spend a couple weeks uh, over there, and uh, with her family. Her family is uh, scattered around. My family. Uh, in, here in America is scattered around, which means that uh, every Christmas really is almost literally the 12 days of Christmas. <laughs> it's like you're opening presents <laughs> every day. Because throughout the country. Yeah. Somewhere or another in England or anywhere, it's like, oh my God, it just goes on forever. But then, but it's all good. Uh, I, I tend to enjoy, I tend to enjoy holidays. And uh, uh, so, yeah, I, I do like the Christmas season. So how about you? You're, uh, you're, uh, yeah, looking forward yeah, to it? Staying- <laughs> Well, I'm not ready, but I'm I'm close. We're staying home this year. Uh, we have um, my two eldest children and my stepchildren, so they're having Christmas with us here, this year, which is lovely. So we will have a house full of children, and it will be loud and chaotic and stressful, but also I suspect wonderful. So how um, many how many to... how many kids are going to be there? Five total. <laughs> okay. So <laughs> we so have so you, they they. You... Do you cook a do you cook an English Christmas dinner or an American Christmas dinner? Um, I don't think we've decided this year. Actually, my husband's going to be cooking. Um, I normally would do lamb or something because I I don't much like turkey. Um, but I don't think we've decided exactly what we're having. I do enjoy a nice English Christmas dinner. My grandmother used to make the best roast potatoes mm. in in the world. It was always the best part about visiting her was the potatoes. You, know, you, can't, um, you can't get goose fat in this country. It, no, it's tricky. It's very you know, tricky. It's, it's, you can get duck fats. I, I, at least I've never been. And, you know, roast, I, I do a lot of roast potatoes. I, I, roast, I like to cook. I cook a lot of uh, mm. roast vegetables. But, uh, you know, you just, you just, it just ain't the same with olive oil. <laughs> it just ain't no, same. it's not. I, I actually, I save bake. It's very bizarre tangent for the audience. I save bacon grease in a jar and... <laughs> I use that and it, it tastes nice. It's not the same, um, but it's about as close as I can get. <laughs> like, you, you should have grown up in the American South. <laughs> I've had friends here <laughs> always got a thing of bacon grease on it. Boy, they slap it on their green beans. They slap it. <laughs> it's, like, it's, it's good. I'm thinking, oh my God, I'm a years of my cutting off my life here. <laughs> yeah, it, it's not something we do regularly, okay. <laughs> but for Christmas, it's nice. All right, good. Yeah. So today we're talking about the truth which is a huge topic. So obviously we're narrowing it down somewhat. Um, Is the New Testament true? And what does that even mean? Can a collection of writings even be called, a collection of ancient writings specifically, even be called true or false? But I'm sure you have thoughts on this. Why do you think it's an important line of inquiry? Oh, well, it's important because, (laughs) you know, there are, um, you know, there are uh, a (laughs) <laughs> several billion Christians in the world who think that the Bible is the guide to truth. And so uh, it is, um, uh, and so it's an important question for, for them, obviously, and for everyone who's a Christian, is what, in, in what sense does the Bible contain truth? And, you know, what does that even, what does it mean and if it if the Bible does contain truth, in what sense? And so there's there's that. But even for those who are not Christian, um, you know, there there can be um, there can be books that are true 
in a sense that they teach important lessons that you affirm. And it, it doesn't have to be a matter of belief. I, I, I personally read a lot of 19th century novels. Uh, I, I, I like Victorian novels. And so I'm reading a, I'm rereading a, a Dickens novel, Dombey and Son right now. And uh, I think, you know, there is truth in fiction, um, but it isn't the same as, you know, truth in history. You know, so I can say that, uh, you know, that the Allies won the Second World War. That would be a true statement. But does, is it true on a deeper level as well? Does it, does it mean that a truth triumphed? Uh, well, that's a, that's a different kind of question. And so when you're dealing with the Bible, you're actually dealing with truth on a number of levels, not just those two levels, but various levels. And that's, that's what I suppose what we need to be talking about. So if we're talking about the truth on different levels, I think something that can be confusing maybe to people is that if we cannot securely attribute the gospels, for example, to a specific person, is that difficulty, or if we're looking at pseudonymous or forgeries, which obviously are wrongly attributed either deliberately or otherwise, does that falsehood then impact the truth of the writing that we're looking at, either, either historical or ethical, moral truth? Yeah, so this is, <laughs> well, okay, you're going right to the heart of it here. <laughs> this is a very, it's a very difficult question that people, I think, um, I don't think people know how to wrestle with it usually. Um, I, I've written a couple of books um, that have set out the case that scholars have been making for a long time. So these are not like, it's not like I invented this. <laughs> or not like, I'm the crazy guy who came up with this. I'm just writing the books <laughs> explaining what people have said for a long time. But scholars have long thought that in the ancient world, um, there are lots of writings that claim to be written by authors who did not write them. Um, we get that today, of course. Uh, usually today, you get somebody who uses a pen name. Right, or not just today, but I mean, like Mark Twain, his name was not Mark Twain, his name was Samuel Clemens, you know, and uh, George Eliot, one of my favorite novelists, uh, was not George, her name was Mary Ann Evans. And so people pay, take pen names, and sometimes they have a reason for doing it, and sometimes they're just doing it. And so you did get that in the ancient world. What you also got in the ancient world a lot more than you get today, which you still do get today, are people claiming to be famous people when they're someone else. Um, you get this in Greek circles and Roman circles and in Jewish circles and in Christian circles. We have all sorts of books written by Peter and Paul and Thomas and James and Philip, just name your ancient Christian that didn't write them. And so the question is, um, so there are lots of questions about that. We will definitely be spending a podcast just on that phenomenon. And, uh, and in my books, I argue, you know, in the ancient world, they considered that lying. You will often hear New Testament scholars say, oh, yeah, nobody thought it was lying. And New Testament scholars will often say, yeah, nobody thought badly of it. And that's just bogus. I mean, it's not true. All you have to do is read the ancient sources. They did call it lying. What they called these things were pseudoi. If you have a book that wasn't, that wasn't written by the guy who says it's right, they called it a pseudo. They called it a lie. <laughs> and so, you know, there's no question they thought this. But the question is, does that invalidate the claims within the book? That's a different question. If you wrote a scientific treatise that argued that E equals MC square, and you claimed that you were Einstein, <laughs> but in fact, you are not, you are Megan, <laughs> does that mean that the equation's wrong? No. Well, what if it's not a mathematical equation or a physics equation or a report of a chemistry experiment? Or what if it's, uh, what if it's a claim about um, the importance of justice? Or what if it's a claim about uh, the superiority of capitalism as a system? Or what if it's a, an argument for socialism as a, as a or you know, does, does it invalidate the claim? My view is no. Claims have to be determined on other grounds. And so this is, you know, when I said originally at various levels, this is one of the levels. It's like, okay, on one level, it's not true that this is the author. On the other level, 
how determining that's different from determining what they're saying is right yeah i think that's a that's a difficulty when you're working with ancient sources um it i when i was doing my phd i I looked an awful lot at uh, mesopotamian royal inscriptions which are historical documents they contain a lot of very useful information for reconstructing history they talk about battles and kings building specific temples so you can track when this temple was built when this temple was renovated um all that kind of thing and the fact that you don't know specifically who wrote that particular inscription actually isn't terribly important and doesn't really say an awful lot about the information contained within it um Super famous example, Law Code of Hammurabi. Did he write it? Probably not. But does it provide us a a really interesting window into um, uh, cultural legal systems in Mesopotamia at that time? Most definitely does. And similarly, when you're looking at um, Herodotus, also a fantastic example, who was um, essentially a travel guide um, from, from ancient Greece, he writes some very suspect things. He writes about uh, women in Babylonia being required to go and essentially prostitute themselves in the temple of Ishtar. No actual evidence for that. And he writes about how he went to Egypt and the Egyptian person he was talking to pointed to an inscription on a pyramid and said, oh yes, this explains how many rations, like radishes or something, the workers were given to build the pyramids. Also not true. But Herodotus was most likely a real person, and some of his other writings are historically verifiable. So I think the question of authorship is is really quite complicated and and saying, oh, either we don't know who wrote this or the the person who says they wrote it is not who they actually were, actually doesn't doesn't really say an awful lot about how far you can trust the information within a document. But it's, you know, it's also it's an interesting set of examples because we're talking about, we're also not just talking about one level of truth and one level of falsehood. We're talking about various levels of truth. I mean, for example, the Code of Hammurabi, if you're using it, if if what you're saying is, does this truly come from the mouth of Hammurabi? You, you probably say, yeah, probably not. So no, it's not true in that sense. Is it a, um, is it a reflection of what some people thought ought to govern how a society functions at that time and place? The answer is that, yes, it probably does. Okay, so it would be true on that level. It would be true on one level, false, but on another level, does it represent how people actually acted at that time? It actually does? happens. Yeah. And then, then the question there is, well, probably not. And so you got, you know, some things are true, some things are false. And so when you're saying, is it true, you, you can't ask it, you know, is it true? I mean, what? What part of it is true? And with Herodotus, like if Herodotus, you know, if you've got an ancient author that's describing customs of somebody. um, So, uh, you know, it may be that it's not true that people really did this, but it would be true that uh, that outsiders were imagining them doing it. Other people thought. And that's interesting, too, because then it can show Mm -hmm. you what a Greek living in some other culture thought and said. And so that would be a true representation of what the Greeks were thinking, but it wouldn't be true for what was really. And so what, you know, in what, what, what do you mean by true and what, what are you looking for? What are you looking for? Mm -hmm. And I think another kind of additional layer is, especially when you're working with textual material, what genre is it Mm -hmm. that you're working with? Yes. Um, Another, again, Mesopotamian example, um, is for me the deification of Naram Sin. Naram Sin was an Akkadian king who um, ruled around the 23rd century BCE. And we have documentation that says he was deified. So he was made a god for a, um, a military victory. As historians, when we look at that, we don't say, oh, this man was clearly a god, because that's overly simplistic and it, it it's just silly. Honestly, what we do is we talk about it in terms of propaganda and royal rhetoric Mm -hmm. rather than is it true or false? So you can't just look at it and and say, oh, he wasn't a god and then also dismiss out of hand everything that the rest of those texts say. That's right. But you're right. A historian would not ask, you know, did he really become a god? You know, they they just wouldn't. 
a historian would never ask that about that text. But the weird thing is with Christianity, not weird, but the expected thing, when it's within Testament, your own religion, yeah. with, it's in your, you do ask that question. Is it true? Did Jesus really ascend to heaven? You know, and so you wouldn't ask that, you know, like a historian, you have, we have accounts analogous to the ones you're talking about uh, in, in your field. We have accounts like that in uh, Greek literature too. Apollonius of Tiana lived in the first century, same century as Jesus. And we have reports of him ascending to heaven uh, at the end of his life. And, uh, you know, an eyewitness talking to, to him after he came back to explain what had happened. And so you get that. But there's no historian that's going to go around asking, now, how do I verify whether happened. that really happened yeah. or not? You, know, you just don't do that because historians don't, that's not a historical question. You, you, you don't ask it as a historical question. But then with Christianity, you have people who are apologists who do ask that question. Okay, how do we prove that it's true that Jesus mm -hmm. ascended to heaven? You would never ask that of other historical figures. You know, you don't go around asking, did Romulus really go to? You just don't. And so, so it could be a true story. Okay, so okay. <laughs> Here's one thing I wanted to say when we're getting into this whole thing. When we when when my kids when my kids were young, we used to watch a movie. We would watch a movie, and the kids would say, after getting into this movie for a while, it's pretty interesting. The kids would say, "Is this a true story?" And I would always say, "Yes." And they say. No, wait a second. Did this really happen? I said, oh, no, it didn't happen. Because <laughs> truth isn't just about what happened, right? Mm -hmm. And so if you talk about a, uh, you know, somebody in, uh, you know, in Assyria or somebody in Rome or somebody in Greece or somebody in Japan who is deified, uh, you know, when you say it's true, what does it mean? Does it, do you mean historically? Do you mean... Mm -hmm. In terms of my religious faith, does it mean does it mean that some is it symbolic? You know what is it? Yeah, it, it's it's quite the question. And I wanted to ask actually when so with with my usual source material from Mesopotamia, it, you often will deal with a corpus, so a group of texts that are the same genre, maybe the same time period, maybe the same geographical location. I mentioned royal inscriptions. You can look at literary texts or liturgical texts or a group of letters. With the New Testament, I feel like that it, it's a corpus in and of itself, but it is a very diverse corpus that I think in a way you don't often see that kind of diversity in a single corpus outside of uh, New Testament studies. Hmm. When you're dealing with something that complex and varied, how do you go about deciding what is reliable specifically for reconstructing history and what is propaganda or metaphor or yeah. theology? How do you kind of yeah. unpick all of that? Well, that's a, it. Yeah, it's really important because, um, uh, what one area of truth, of course, is historical truth. You know, what really happened in the past? Um, it's not It's not the only, you know, and you were mentioning genres, you know, if you, some genres are not interested in that. You know, if you write poetry, um, you know, poetry is not int usually interested in what actually happened. And novels aren't interested in what actually happened, but there are genres that are interested in what really happened. Um, but it's difficult when one of the genres is narrative. You know, in what sense is narrative history? Um, and so I think when you come to the Gospels, for example, you get Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the four Gospels, and they sound like they sound like biographies, right? You get the you get the birth or the beginning, and then you, yeah, you get life, you get teachings, you get deeds, you get death. You know, it's like you get in a biography. And today. When people read biographies, they simply assume the the author is trying to tell you what actually happened, and there'll be disagreements about how to interpret things, and disagreements about what did happen, and that sort of. But the author's trying to basically the idea is to show what actually happened, and so our natural inclination then is to read the Gospels like that because that's what we're used to in biographies, and I certainly think the Gospels are biographies but in the sense that they're telling the life of Jesus, and they're, they're telling the life of Jesus, and there were biographers in the ancient world. We have a number of them, Suetonius and Plutarch, and, and I was mentioning Diogenes Laertius in a previous episode. And so there are people who write biographies, but the writing of biography was very different then. 
uh, in part because they simply didn't have the data retrieval systems and the methodologies and that we have today. Most of the time they didn't have libraries. And so, uh, <laughs> you know, so it's not, uh, they didn't have the research tools. And so they didn't try, I mean, they, they want, what they said, they wanted to get right, but they, they weren't like obsessed about getting everything like down to the detail correct. And they were far more interested in ancient biography. They're far more interested in showing what a person was like than getting the details correct. And so people that, approach the that, gospels. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. So I was just going to ask, is that attempt to get the essence of someone's character for the ancient writers more of the truth that they're trying to get at than what we might term truth in terms of historical accuracy. That's a great, that's a great way of putting it because it's exactly what we were talking about earlier with this example, because for an ancient person, like Plutarch was writing a biography of Alexander the Great. For Plutarch, what is true is what is the portrayal of the character. For us, we're just interested in, did he really cross the Euphrates there? <laughs> you know, like we want the we want the accuracy, historical accuracy, and of course he wants to be accurate, but but that's not really what he's after. He's after expressing the truth of who this person was, and if you think about the Gospels like that, it solves a lot of problems because you're not worried so much about you know did Jesus really walk on the water at this part of the Sea of Galilee? It's really about like what is the, what is the author trying to say that this means. And what matters for the author is far more what it means than what actually happened. I'm, I'm not saying that they didn't care what happened. They, they did care what happened, but it wasn't the kind of obsession that we have in the modern world since the Enlightenment. It, it's really since the 18th century that this became a major concern for people, which means they're reading the Bible with kinds of questions and assumptions that the authors themselves didn't have. So that we today, we do want to know what happened. And so there are methods that historians use to figure out, did this happen, did that happen, the other thing with Alexander the Great and with Jesus and everyone else. But but when you're trying to deal with this genre and you're asking what really, you know, what is true, a story can be true if it didn't happen. It's just true in a different sense. Do you think that modern Christians run into problems with this because they're reading often the Bible and specifically the Gospels for historical accuracy. So they not only get an historically inaccurate picture, because as you've mentioned, the, the, the Gospels aren't like a blow by blow detailed account of what actually happened. And they miss the truth maybe that the authors were intending them to get. So they miss the, the main message. I think this happens all the time. Uh, and I think it especially happens with uh, people who have a conservative theological bent who are really just interested in what happened. And their, their idea, you know, the idea is that God is a God who acts in history. This is their, their idea. That God is a God who acts in history. And so the history really matters. Uh, and so you have to get the history right. And I, you know, I don't disagree with that. I, I absolutely think history matters. I mean, I think it really matters. It matters if there was a Holocaust. <laughs> you know, it, it matters what happened on January 6th. I mean, it ha matters what happens in elections. It matters what happens. But if that's the only thing that matters, it seems like you've got kind of a dry life. I mean, you mean like facts and figures of what matter to you? Uh, what about like things that are actually meaningful to your being, like, like the meaning of life? I mean, it doesn't matter that um, you know, if, if, if Jesus feeds the multitudes with five loaves and two fish, you know, does it really matter that that's exactly what happened so that you can make a little note of it in your book? That, okay, yeah, on, on June 3rd, on in the year 29, Jesus in this, you know, you make your little notation, you come up with the history. Is that what the, is that what the story's about? I mean, the story's about feeding people who are hungry mm. and using whatever resources you have to do it. I mean, does that, does that, does that matter? <laughs> mm -hmm. And can't that be true in that sense without the the detail being right? You know, so I so again, you know, what does it mean to say something uh, is true? You mentioned earlier that um, when we're looking at poetry, it's much easier because that's a genre that we have. We understand that poetry is not supposed to be like literal fact. 
in the same way that we would expect historiographical writing. Uh, the example my husband always uses is is in I can't remember Psalms. I think um, I think David says I uh, wept all night and my tears were my food. Like we don't think David actually ate his tears. It's just a metaphor to show how very sad he was, right? Yeah. In the New Testament, do you have um, divisions of, of genre that align more closely with what a modern audience would expect so that it's it's more of a natural read? So you can read it and say, oh, this is poetry and understand the truth of the poetry as opposed to, say, reading the Gospels and looking for the historical facts. Uh, it's an important question, and, his, and scholars are very keen to do what you were suggesting earlier, which is look at the genre of a writing. And so you you have to see what how is, the way genre works. And so you know everybody knows there are different genres today. A science fiction novel is not the same as a an op ed, and and neither of that's like you know like like a scientific treatise. And you have to read different things differently. And the way a genre works is that the author and the audience have this kind of unspoken contract that this is how this one's going to go. So that, you know, if you read an account of how a uh, how there's a biological agent that's escaped the laboratory and, and has polluted the entire you know, water supply of New York City, you know, if you read it in a science fiction novel, you know, you know pretty much how that's going. If you read it on the front page of the New York Times, you read it very that's differently. different, yeah. Because you've got the contract between the author and the reader is different in those two contexts, and the genre is the contract. And, and then so, you'd be very upset also if you read that in the New York Times and then found out it was fiction. <laughs> yes, you would. <laughs> you would, and like, oh yeah, I was just making that one up. You know, like, well, like the War of the Worlds, right? Where people, it was like yeah, exactly. you know, this radio <laughs> program that it was just, it's like a radio program and people missed that part. And oh my God, they took it literally. Well, it doesn't lead to good results sometimes. And so, uh, but with the Bible, it's definitely that way. And certainly that way with the New Testament. Um, we, um, you know, we talked last time about the book of Revelation. Uh, and how people read it as a prediction of what's going to happen in our future. And the problem is they don't understand the genre. The apocalypse genre is not a literalist prediction of what's going to happen. It's, this is not, that's not how that genre works. So if you read it as a straightforward prediction of what's literally going to happen, you read it one way. And, and if you actually understand the genre, you read it a, a different way. There are books in the New Testament, though, that appear to be meant to be read literally is what, you know, so especially the epistles. Paul writes letters and he uh, he addresses problems in his churches. He writes the city of Corinth and he says, I've heard this is happening, that's happening, that's happening, that's happening, none of it's good. You need to do this, you need to do that, you need to do this other thing. And you read it as a letter um, uh, as you, you know, uh, where he's not like making stuff up. Uh, it's not a narrative. Um, but you also understand that when you're listening to a conversation like that, where you're reading the author, you're hearing one side of the conversation and you have to reconstruct the other side. And so it's like you're talking on the phone. You're hearing somebody talking on the phone. You hear what they're saying and you have to imagine what the other side's saying. And so, so you treat letters like that because that's what you've got. You've got the author, but it's not somebody telling a poem or telling them. And, and so, yes, the genre, the genre ends up mattering a lot. And there are some genres that are meant to be straightforward and literal. So I think no one would disagree. I mean, you said it earlier that a lot of Christians reading the Bible read it to find truth and instruction and an understanding of how the world is and should be and, and how God is working um, to bring about his kingdom. And clearly you find value in the Bible separate from any, any religious importance that others may place on it. How do you think, or what do you think is a good way to find the truths in the Bible that are useful and valuable to modern society, but that does not result in placing your own religious values on other people who do not hold to those same values? 
Yeah. You know, the, it's very, um, it's very interesting how people tend, tend to read the Bible. Um, the, you know, a lot of people, a lot of people, uh, read the Bible as if it's a kind of a Ouija board, you know, which gives you the, your guide to the future. So you kind of, you know, you take your Bible and you open up, open you stick your finger down and, and it's like, you know, God's now, you know, you've got a question and you open up, you read a verse and now, ah, that's the answer, you know? And so, and so it's, it's like a, and so that's, I don't think that's, I mean, it's okay. People want to do that. It's okay. I mean, I'm, it's fine. You know, a lot of other people though, like people read the book of Revelation, don't read it, read it like a Ouija board. The, the, these prophecy writers today, the people who are predicting what's going to happen in, you know, in 2026 or whatever, they, they, what they do is they take a, a verse from Nehemiah and a verse from Ezekiel and a verse from Matthew and a verse from Revelation and a book from Daniel and they tie them all together and they, they treat it like a jigsaw puzzle. It's not a Ouija board, it's a jigsaw puzzle where like you got these puzzles hidden everywhere and you, the pieces and you got to put them together in the right place and then you see what the, then you see what the picture is. And so, well, that's, you know, the thing is you don't read books either way, right? That's not how you read a book. If you're going to read a novel, you don't read it like a Ouija board. Day. And so, yeah. So the um, what scholars try to do is to try and uh, help people understand that there are there are better ways of reading books than others. And with the Bible, it's a little bit tricky because people who don't use either of those two methods, typically, if you go to a Bible study, like you're just in a church and you aren't scholars or anything, you just go into a Bible study and you're studying like the book of Galatians. What you do is, you know, somebody will read a verse or two and they'll talk about what it means to them. And, you know, how, how it affects their lives. And usually it's got nothing to do with the book of Galatians. And so what scholars try to do is to mediate in these various ways of reading. And what scholars have done for several hundred years now is insisted that it's important to know what an author meant. Um, and to do that, you've got to understand something about the historical context they're writing in what the situation is, what the what, what kind of terminology is being used, what's actually being said. How do you interpret this in a way you would interpret something from the newspaper when you actually try and figure out what the sentence means? And only then do you try to figure out what it means for your life. You're not just kind of picking up a verse and just going off on some kind of scattered thing, you know, about, oh, yeah, for me. This, this, this. So what's it going to do with what he says here, you know? No, it's, it's actually engaging in a serious study to try and understand what this may have meant in order to help explain how it can have meaning today. Uh, and so it's so there's there's both the process of interpreting the text in its historical context, trying to figure out what the author probably meant, and another thing saying, like, how does this apply to me? Those aren't the same thing, but they should be connected somehow. Most a lot of people just completely have a disconnect. Other people are just all interested in the literal meaning and just, you know, and differences between then and now be damned. And, uh, you know, I don't think either way is right. You've, you've got to figure out what it meant. And then you try to figure out, does, does that meaning have any relevance for me? This is a completely off the wall question that I literally just thought of. Um, <laughs> so read a response, which is what you were saying about the, the Bible study group, reading, reading a passage and saying this, this is the value it has for me. Obviously divorced from the context the book was written in, the author's original intent. Do you not think reader response can be in its own way a kind of truth in the Bible? I think people certainly find truth that way. Um, I think with the Bible, people do it that way because they understand it to be God's word that's speaking to them today. Um, and and so they treat it differently uh, from other books because they they don't read you know they don't read David Copperfield that way where they'll just read a line and, and say what it means to them and so it's because it's divinely inspired that they treat it that way and so I, I understand that and it does provide comfort and solace to people it also leads to some very bad things mm -hmm. um, because their interpretations then they, they think that they come up with something in their head and they put it on the Bible and the Bible's not saying that at all and so. So I think that that I think that that's uh, I think that's a problem. But the other issue for me is that if um, 
if if I were a Christian who believed that God inspired the the books of the Bible, the sixty six books of the English Bible, if I thought that those were inspired, I would believe that God had inspired books. He didn't inspire Ouija boards or jigsaw puzzles, or he 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 inspired a book. And presumably, if God inspired a book, he wants you to read it like a book. And if you read any book from the ancient world, you, of course, you want to know when the author was living and what his context mm -hmm. was and why what he's addressing. And that's how you read books. And so if God inspired books, I just think that people should read them as books. And in this case, it's hard because, you know, we aren't born knowing much about the first century or anything. But I think to understand the book, you really have to you have to learn that kind of material. Thank you. I have to say, I agree entirely. I am a massive fan of understanding historical and cultural context for really any piece of ancient literature. Um, and I, I think understanding it for the Bible, given the place the Bible holds in our civilization is of paramount importance. We are going to take a brief break and we will be back with news from Bart and some more of your excellent audience questions. If you're interested in the Gospels of the New Testament, the book of Genesis, the resurrection of Jesus, the historicity of the Exodus, or anything else connected with the Bible, you should check out my online courses, where I cover all these topics and more. If you'd like to learn about the courses, check them out at bartermancom You can receive a discount on any of your purchases simply by entering the code MJPODCAST. Uh, now, everyone, we're going to have Bart's Weekly Update. This is Bart's Weekly Update, where we get to catch up on all the latest about Dr. Ehrman's book releases, speaking engagements, ehrmanblog.org happenings, and online course launches. Bart, what is going on for you this week? Well, it's and, you know as I, as we said at the beginning, I'm I've got a trip to England planned, and I'm very and, jealous uh, of that, by the way. Very jealous. Well, yeah, I know. Well, you know, I'm from Kansas, so it's like you know, I'm not, <laughs> <laughs> it's more interesting to go to London in some ways. But but the thing about the thing about an Eng, uh, Christmas trip in England is um, English people don't have this problem that Americans have, which is that Americans have turkey at Thanksgiving, and a lot of when I was growing up, you also wanted a turkey at. Christmas. And as you were saying earlier, you know, like, uh, you know, you don't even like it once a year. I, I actually like <laughs> turkey a lot. But the problem is, uh, you know, in, in England, uh, I, well, I guess tradition was a goose, maybe. I don't know. But it was a, <laughs> but but, you know, turkeys. And so uh, for me, it's really uh, it's a different meal in some ways. Like uh, like uh, Americans are not big on roasted parsnips, even though they ought to be. And uh, roasted parsnips never, are delicious. Oh, they're fantastic. No, it's okay. completely underused, completely underused. But also things like bread pudding. Like I never knew what bread pudding was. For. <laughs> and uh, But the other, you have these. So there's there are lots of differences, including, by the way, crackers. If you tell an American that you're having crackers <laughs> for Christmas, they say, what? It's saltines? That's your Christmas? No. But crackers are like these explosive, like, Things what do you, you call them? They're and like present. Yeah. You pull and they pop, and then with little gifts inside and stuff. So that's all good. But what I was thinking is this turkey. Like you know, you're gonna have another big turkey. I just add one. <laughs> gonna have another <laughs> one now. The problem is you go with a turkey. It's such a big. You know, you eat it for about two weeks after you're done eating, and now yeah. you're gonna do it again. <laughs> so it's a lot of turkey. It's just it's <laughs> that's two what's going on my life. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh. right. uh, we have now some time for listeners' questions. So thank you to everyone who sent those in. Now it's time for questions from listeners, where Bart answers real questions submitted by misquoting Jesus fans. If you'd like to submit a question for future segments, please visit bartermancom slash askbart. So we have a good selection of questions on a variety of topics today. Again, if you want to ask Bart a question, you can go to bartermancom forward slash ask Bart. We get a lot of questions in. So if we don't get to yours, I'm very sorry. We'll do our best to get through as many as we can. So first question, if a scribe changes biblical text because they have a different theological opinion, is that change divinely inspired? And if it is, does that mean that the previous scribe who copied that passage wasn't divinely inspired or did God just change their mind? Okay, well, that's a great question, and it's one that you know technically I can't answer because I don't know 
what God inspires and what God doesn't inspire. But I can say that this is a phenomenon that happens uh, a good deal. I, I talk about it a bit in my book, Misquoting Jesus, where scribes have changed the text in order because they think it should say something else or thought it really means something else. And so the question is, well, is the change inspired or not? And early Christians had different opinions about this. There was one uh, church father named Origen in the uh, middle of the third century, early, early third century, who thought that not just uh, the originals were inspired, but also the textual changes made by scribes were inspired by God. And uh, so that got around the problem of, you know, what if we don't know the original, we don't have the inspired word anymore, and you say, well, actually, we have these change texts, so those are also uh, inspired. What's actually inspired or not, uh, yeah, that's a theological question that I'm not qualified to answer. <laughs> Uh, when did Christians begin to believe that the original books of the Old, New Testament were inerrant or at least inspired? That is, it's difficult to imagine that a buddy of Paul or the author of Mark considered their writings inspired when asked to prove that. Yeah, well, uh, right. So I, I definitely don't think the authors of the Gospels thought that they were writing inspired scripture. When Matthew wrote his book of Matthew. He didn't think I'm writing the Bible now. He was writing an account of Jesus' life. Of course, he thought it was right. And Paul, I mean, Paul is somewhat a little different because he really does see, seem to think that he's really inspired by the Spirit of God for everything he thinks. And so maybe he did think of his writings, but he didn't think they were inspired in the way that people today do. The, the books of the Bible started being considered to be on a level with those of the Old Testament. So written in the, not written by God, but inspired by God, probably early in the second century, uh, or maybe a little bit earlier, some, some of the books. And, uh, and eventually this became the view that they were inspired. But that didn't mean that they were inerrant in every detail the way that many modern fundamentalists would say, or, or even strong evangelical Christians. Um, that view of inerrancy that there's no mistake of any kind, scientific, geographic, you know, philosophical, religious, any no different, nothing, no mistake of any kind. That didn't come about until the end of the 19th century. That became a view that uh, was developed in England principally, but then uh, came over to America that, uh, that was in response to the rise of the sciences. Uh, Darwin, for example, the geologists, for example, dating the earth and the evolution, they, they wanted to insist, no, the Bible is literally right on everything. And that's when you started getting inerrancy, which strangely enough, many people today think is Christianity. That if you don't believe the Bible's inerrant, you can't be a Christian. Yeah, well, that's completely modern. End of the I've certainly century. been told I'm not a Christian because I don't believe in inerrancy. So I didn't no. realize it was such a late idea, though. It's a late idea. People tell me I'm not a Christian for other reasons, but that's certainly one of them. <laughs> <laughs> um, so a questioner has uh, put in a quote of Galatians. There is no longer Jew nor Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male or female for all of you are one in Jesus Christ. Does Paul think men and women are equal when he says these verses or is he addressing another? This is a this is a topic we easily could have done, uh, dealt with in our previous uh, episode on uh, women in early Christianity, and it's because it's a very important verse. We could probably we'll spend more episodes on that on that issue. This is a very important uh, uh, important verse in the Book of Galatians. Paul says in Christ, you know, there's not slave or free or male or female, uh, and so are they equal? And the answer is complicated. This is why we probably could spend an entire episode on this mm -hmm. issue. Um, because Paul does think that men and women are on equal standing uh, within the Christian faith and that men are not superior to women as Christians. But at the same time, Paul does think that in society as it, we're living in it now, uh, women are w wives, especially are to be subservient to their husbands and women are uh, are to fulfill their roles and men are to fulfill their roles. So he, he didn't go all the way with what we would think of as equality between the sexes in the current social order, even though spiritually he thought that they were equal. For many people, uh, that's suggested, you know, it really wasn't very uh, advanced as a, as a modern feminist. And that I think that was probably right. But other people point out that the equality in Christ is really something for somebody to be saying in that context. It is more liberating. Uh, and so um, 
So the answer is not, it's an ambivalent answer because it's a, it's an ambivalent issue with Paul because he thought both that men and women were equal, but not, they weren't equal yet. Thank you. And we have uh, one more question. Um, first Corinthians fifteen twenty nine talks about baptizing the dead. What was that all about? Did they baptize on behalf of dead people? So, um, Paul's trying to convince people in Corinth that there's going to be a future physical resurrection of the body. Bodies are going to be raised uh, from the dead. Uh, and people completely misread 1 Corinthians 15. People think that Paul is talking about there's going to be a future resurrect, spiritual resurrection that's not a physical resurrection. That's just the opposite of what he's arguing. He's arguing there's going to be a future physical resurrection of bodies because Jesus was raised physically in the body. Um, in that context, he he uses an argument that is very difficult to understand because he tell, says the Corinthians, if it's not going to happen, why do you why are you baptizing for the dead? What's it mean? <laughs> and there are roughly 29,000 interpretations of this verse. <laughs> um, as Excellent. you know, in the more... In the Mormon Church, um, they they do baptize uh, for the dead, so that uh, if you baptize as a kind of replace, you, you're getting baptized in the place of someone else who's died already, so that they can they can have been baptized, um, and so it may be something like that. Um, it may be that um, that people. Well, we really don't know because Paul doesn't say this is some kind of practice, and I don't know whether he initiated it uh, or not. But is it is it being bap is it being baptized for relatives who died uh, before uh, they were um, before they were Christian, so that they can, too can have salvation? Is it being baptized for people who uh, were uh, had committed to Christ but hadn't been baptized yet, like an infant? Uh, you know, and so that they can have the experience of baptism? Is it being, uh, is it ba being baptized for those who are uh, dead in spirit? But dead, I mean, you know, what, what does it mean? We don't know. We don't know what it means. Thank you. Before we finish out for the week, would you mind just giving your final thoughts on what we've been talking about? Uh, yeah, so it's a, you know, it's a very important question about what, what it means to say the Bible uh, is true. I, over the last probably 20 years, I have had people tell me that, um, you know, when they find out that we don't have the, for example, we don't have the original manuscripts of the New Testament, but we have changes in the manuscripts. And so people say, okay, so the Gospels got changed, so they're not true. And that's, that's a, for me, no, that's not right. Knowing what an author wrote isn't the same thing as saying that what he wrote is true. You might not have the original words, but his words might have been true. You might not have his original words and the words you now have are true. But there, there, it's a different question. Truth works on different levels. Is it true we have what Matthew really wrote? That's one question. Uh, is it true that Matthew actually wrote it? That's another question. Is it true that the historical events that he narrates actually happened? That's another question. Is it true that the teachings of Jesus, in fact, are what God wants you to learn? That's another question. It's like there, there's all these levels of truth, and we shouldn't collapse them and think that if you answer one of those questions, you've answered all of them. Truth works on many different levels, and it's important for all of us, not just with the Bible, but just generally, to think, you know, when you're asking if something is true, what do you mean by that, and why is it important to you? Thank you so much, Bart. Audience, thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed the show. If you did, please subscribe to the podcast so you don't miss any future episodes. Remember also that you can use the code MJPODCAST for a discount on all of Bart's courses at www.bartermann.com. Misquoting Jesus will be back next week. Bart, what are we talking about? We're going on to something different. We're going to talk about the King James Bible. Uh, wh where did that come from? And what is it? And is it valuable? Is it is it valid? Is it what? Why do people so devoted to it? And what what can we say about the King James Bible? That'll be next time. Beautiful. Thank you so much, and thank you, audience, and goodbye. This has been an episode of Misquoting Jesus with Bart Ehrman. We'll be back with a new episode next Tuesday, so please be sure to subscribe to our show for free on your favorite podcast listening app or on Bart Ehrman's YouTube channel so you don't miss out. From Bart Ehrman and myself, Megan Lewis, thank you for joining us.